Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. <coughs> Chuck, Chuck, we're we're on. Hi, <laughs> I'm Josh Hayes here with Chuck Manley. Uh, Scott Moon's off doing Scott Moon stuff today. Who knows? Uh, wh- honestly, though, that's the subversion that we're going. We're subverting your right. expectations because Scott isn't here in the show. That's that it. is the truth. And He's show's subversive. over. Uh, yeah uh so youtube's playing with my emotions here because rick taylor uh, rick is uh apparently the first comment but the first comment i see is keith is keith taylor yeah that's what i'm saying see. howdy rick and i've checked it on steam yard and i checked it on youtube and keith is still the first one so somehow rick posted a ghost post apparently correct me if i'm wrong I he's could hacking be wrong. he's hacking man yeah, he's hacking wrong. to get the first he wants those golf clubs know uh well let's just give the golf clap to everybody today well yeah thanks for showing up guys and give everyone the golf clap of appreciation of of course i was there first of course (laughs) i see everybody says everybody says rick was there all right well rick we just gave your clap away so sorry about that (laughs) tom says go with some valor true chuck's distracted of it you know I, i don't know if you guys have noticed the trend but uh chuck likes to read books upside down before the show sometimes what's hilarious is waiting while the uh pre-roll is going and he's already got the book up just not even paying attention it's my thing awesome you know when you've read as many books as i have sometimes you got to flip them upside down to make it interesting oh it changes the experience a little bit yeah it does it does uh let's see Corey's here what's up Corey? tom hello hello charlie d is in oregon today Mm -hmm. oregon trail uh Speaking of the Oregon Trail, I've been watching 1883, and holy crap, that show good is stuff. Oh, I mean, it's really good. But like my wife and I were watching, and there's like so you know, like some people are like, oh man, it'd be so much cooler to live in like no the Wild West or <laughs> when the Roman Empire. And I'm like, there's some hell dude, no. He fell off a wagon and got ran over by a wooden <laughs> tire and died in the middle of nowhere. I'm not sure that that's. <laughs> I mean, no. I'm cool just sitting that here works. in my air conditioning. That's it. I mean, just, just that. Just <laughs> take me back to a time when there's not a such thing as central AC. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm done. Why? I'm I, why live? I'm, Porta potties? Know. Come on, they didn't <laughs> even have enough. bathroom or toilet paper. <laughs> uh, Barda today is here. What's up, Bard? Hello, welcome. Who else is here? Did I miss? Uh, this is odd to see Scott McGlass in the chat. That's weird. Always he happened. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I saw Blake. Listen, uh, I don't have the ability to ban people from the chat, but if I did, Blake would have been the first today. I want to learn how to subvert expectations like The Last Jedi, the greatest film experience of the 21st century. Blake, be can ashamed I, of yourself. Can I Blake. please have what yours? Like, because man, yeah, <laughs> not. Good. Who else is here? Did I miss anybody? Uh, I, Susan Ellis is here. Welcome. Welcome. Leo's still driving. All right. Well, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, we've got a lot to cover today. We are going to talk about the the main theme of the episode. Uh, we've got some uh, winners possibly to announce. Oh, yeah. I forgot all about that. Yeah. But first, we're going to talk about our updates because... <laughs> uh, uh, because that's fun. Uh, I'm going to go first because I always let everybody else go first with their updates. You go I'm first, gonna man. Go first today. Uh, let's see. So I finished a short. I writ a wrote writ written. I have written a short story uh, that I submitted and then unsubmitted uh, <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> well, so here's the deal. I submitted a short story to the Bain uh, Adventure Adventure Fantasy Award. Uh, like I do every year, uh, but then realized hmm, I co-host their podcast. I wonder, I wonder if that <laughs> if that that disqualifies disqualifies you? me. And yeah, I, went, I, I, I went and looked at the rules, and it says no Bane employees. So I reached out to Tony, and I'm like, I know I'm not technically an employee, and she's like, Well, you're close enough. So yeah, that would that would look a little hinky, if a little sketch, a little, a little sketch. sketchy, a little sus. So uh, I might put that up on my uh, 
on my website somewhere if uh, someone wants to take partake of uh, of the reading may do that it was a little fun I like doing that just writing stuff to put just you know yeah. free stories just you know it was, it was eight thousand words i did it in i don't know a week it was yeah, not, i think i might uh, get two visits to my website every year and one of those <laughs> is me checking up on it so yeah. you know you're like is it still here hello Hello, is this thing on? I'm so I got a blog. I still I haven't even posted to yet because I just don't know what to do with blogs anymore. I can't remember. I think I was talking with uh, somebody who we were talking about uh, newsletters, and um, I always, always, always forget to send out a newsletter. And uh, oh, it coincidentally it was on the Bain podcast I did a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to Sarah Hoyt, and she was mentioning how she always just like goes for months without updating your newsletter. And then she's like, I should send something out and then type something that morning. And I, that, and I was like, man, I really need to send one out. Whoops. Yeah, I don't even have a newsletter. So, well, I just do a sub stack every, every now and then I, I should do another one. Uh, let's see. So I did the short story. I've been uh, getting back into weaponized. I can't remember if I mentioned last week, but I finished tranquility. Yay. And well, my half anyway. And so now I'm jumping back into weaponized, uh, but I've been out of the story so long. I kind of had to go back and revisit some chapters, uh, found some things that uh, I, I wrote um, thinking it would work, but then coming back to it and thinking nah, it really didn't work. So I had to scrap about 10,000 words and uh, started kind of rebuilding the middle half because I... It really like it, it. I couldn't leave like at the end or at the beginning. I left right in the middle, and the middle sometimes is like we've talked about the murky middles before. Those are like the hardest That's sometimes the hard part. getting over. And so I jump back in, and man, man, this just doesn't work. And um, but I, I've been in it for a couple of days now, and and the words are kind of coming, coming back, getting back into it. Uh, I finished an outline for the Aspect War. Uh, well, the first book of the Aspect War, Chorus of Souls. I finished the outline uh, this weekend. Uh, yeah, it's about six, seven thousand words. Um, real rough, just um, more of the whole like the basic plot, and not any of like the world building or the character development or anything like that. And uh, that was kind of a fun exercise to get that out of the way. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of reading. I finished Dawn Shard by Brandon Sanderson and I started Warbreaker. And the interesting thing about those books is Dawn Shard, which is a novella, which is actually like a short novel, which is supposed to be a short story, whatever. Brandon's crazy. Uh, Brandon does what Brandon wants to do. Yeah. Uh, he, so it, it, Warbreaker was his first or second novel, I think, second or third novel published. And uh, in that, story they talk about breaths and breaths have a it's part of the magic system and and you can see if you while when you ingest breaths you see like colors more vibrantly uh and you have these different abilities that you can use while you have the breath and then you can expend the breath to do other things it's a really uh, interesting magic system well in the end uh yeah right everybody take a shot thanks thomas for reminding me uh at the end of dawn shard uh something happens which ties dawn shard into warbreaker which are com two completely different i mean it's in the cosmere right so like everything's connected but it was really interesting to see one of the stories that i started reading and then finished kind of meshing together i thought that was really cool uh let's see i think that was it oh also i saw the batman i, I finished i finally watched it and Good God, what a great movie. I mean, just I think it's probably my favorite Batman film ever. Um, really, really good. Really, really good. Uh, uh, I, I can't think of anything I didn't like about it. I mean, it wasn't... So, like, you think of all the other Batmans, and you're like, Mike, Michael Keaton's Batman. Everybody was like, oh, Michael Keaton was the best Batman. Meh. But it was like a step up in campiness from... The Adam West Batman. Like, it was still campy. Like, if you go back and watch it now, sure. you're like, what? <clears throat> yeah, 89, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we don't even talk about Val Kilmer's Batman or George Clooney's Batman. Uh, but then you talk really about... Really anything Clooney. that... Uh, uh, what was that director? Joel name? Schumacher. Joel Schumacher. Any, anything he did with the, the suiting up shots with yeah. the nipples and... The yeah, and then he turns around, and you got the like the the butt the butt shot. shot. Yeah, 
Uh, so yeah, we won't even mention those, but like m- one of my favorites is the dark Knight, or has been for a really mm-hmm. long time. And, uh, but more so for the Joker, not for the Batman. And I think, uh, Batman begins was about Batman, but the dark Knight and the dark Knight rises, they were really like about the antagonist. Like they, yeah. it was about Joker and about, they Batman were, they were more about Gotham and the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that this Batman was about Batman and yeah um more about mad mad but they, they really didn't have any bruce wayne elements i mean there was a no. few um and and kind of the central p- plot tied back to something with bruce well what but, i loved about it was it's year two so he's yes. only been doing the batman thing for like two years now and yeah it shows i mean the way they played him you know the batmobile it starts out the movie in pieces you know he's right. putting it together right and the but the thing that i really loved is in this one he was the detective yes you know 100 the batman i grew up with in the comics was the world's greatest detective right and, and that i think that was lacking in a lot like and that they, was lacking in every movie before this one i mean they touched on it a little bit but in this one i mean this one had like almost like police procedural types you know oh yeah criminal sure. science type stuff in it which i loved yeah and i thought that's that's the batman i can relate to yeah and he and, and also he screwed up a couple of times you know <laughs> like, yeah like yeah, with yeah, the wingsuit yeah. you know it's like okay he, he's still he's still finding his feet here yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, I was really glad they didn't do the origin story. I mean, how many times are we going to do that for a superhero? I want to see the next Spider-Man as a Spider-Man year two, like not an origin story. I think that was really cool. Uh, So anyway, yeah, I watched that and and some of that actually will will tie into the uh, the the subject of the 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 theme for today's show. Uh, But Chuck, let's uh, talk about your update, man. What have you been doing? Well, uh, still, as usual, clicking away on Jack Dark 3. I've got Jack and Eli in dire straits at the moment. Um, but uh, aside from that, uh, Julia's, my daughter's softball uh, JV season finally wrapped, nice. which means I don't have uh, five day a week practices and <laughs> tournaments every weekend now. Uh, so hopefully I'm, I'm hoping my writing time will get picked up again. I had a a good couple of days here recently. Um, so I'm kind of getting back into the swing of that. Um, as far as the media I've consumed, I watched a really cool show on Apple TV called severance and it's kind of science fictiony in that it's about this company where, they do a procedure called the severance yeah. where they basically tie your memories to a location. So what they do is they sever your brain and your memory pathway. So when you're outside of work, you remember everything you've ever done outside of work. But okay. when you, when you get in the elevator to go down to your office, all of those memories go away and all you remember is what you know about work and then basic things like your name and general facts and stuff, but you have no memory of your life outside the office. And when you're in the office, or I mean, when you're outside the office, you have no idea what you do at work every day. It's a, and it's such a weird concept, but I decided to give it a chance because it had an actor that I like in it. And, uh, and I watched, I watched the whole thing and it was very cool. Very I'll have cool. to check that out. You said it's on Apple TV. Yeah, Apple TV. So I, I enjoyed that a lot. And then obviously I saw the Batman, and um, and I've been reading. Where's that book? I've been reading this Stephen. There it is. I've been reading this Stephen King book, mm. and uh, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, it's your typical icy dead people kind of thing. You know, um, but it's Stephen King. It's kind of a uh, at this point, it's just like. It's a Stephen King book. Right. <laughs> you know? right. I, haven't gotten to, I haven't gotten to the end yet, though, because that's that's where I always find my criticism to him is with those endings. Yeah. But aside from that, yeah, it's just I'm kind of I'm about to get into my summertime routine when the kids aren't quite so busy and uh, I got more time to to get things done. So <laughs> I see dead people. I see dead people. Two at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, crazy. Right. <laughs> hey, Scott's here. Hey, Scott, what's up, dude? Hey, Scott. He must be on his phone. 
Corey said the new bat, the new DCU is built around this Batman movie. Interesting. I would not hate that. Uh, I mean, if they were going to build a whole DCU around it, they, you know, I, th- I think that would mean they'd kind of go the, they'd make Superman, yeah. Superman, you know, the good guy Superman to contrast with the Dark Knight kind of thing. So, yeah, I wouldn't hate that at all. So bad they can't do a DCU without Superman. Superman is my least favorite superhero. Well, because he's. It's like I always said about the whole superhero thing is like, you've got to have that relatability and the more powers you stack onto a character, the less relatable they're going to be because they can solve any problem you can relate to with a thought. You know, I can't remember if we talked about this last show or not, but I remember there was a, uh, I'm rewatching Brandon Sanderson's, uh, courses, his BYU stuff from 2020. Yeah. yeah. And one of the, and they talked about this in that class where he said his favorite Superman's of all time were the Lois and Clark TV show. And the reason they were the Lois and Clark TV show is while it was kind of campy and yeah, it was TV for back in the day, they had real problems that people could, uh, 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 relate to relate to, uh, because they didn't have the budget, like the man of steel where they're blowing up buildings. Right. And so all of the, all of the trial, all of the stuff that he had to do was like really small center focused. And like he was saying, you know, one of the episodes, it was, you have to deal with all this lowest, like personal drama. And at the end you're like, Oh yeah, I've got to go blow up all these aliens. I got to, yeah, I got to go beat up Brainiac or whatever. Yeah. Well, you that's fly the, up and laser vision, all the things in right, the episode. That's over. the exact reason I'm a big fan of the current Superman show. Uh, Superman and Lois. <laughs> he said, Josh, <laughs> has stopped working. Come on. I can't think of a word one time, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really like that show because it's basically uh, Superman and Lois after they've been married a while and they got a couple of teenage boys and one of them starts um, developing powers and stuff but it's really cool because it's like you've got Superman who can lift you know loaded oil tankers and stuff and do all his amazing stuff but at the same time he has to go home and be a dad to a teenage kid Rough. which is a whole different superpower <laughs> Rough. Yeah. so it's like uh yeah i'm I'm a real big fan of, of superman and lois i think they're doing an excellent job with that one Corey agrees Corey says it's the best superman series he's ever seen. i i agree with Corey on that completely and i and uh uh taylor hockman i think his name is something like that he's i think he's probably my favorite superman it's just the way he the way he handles it, he's he's almost uh, the um, the original one from the '70s Superman. Uh, can't remember the guy's name. Oh, the guy that uh, fell off the horse. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Christopher anyway, Reeves. Christopher Reeves. He's not quite as Dudley Do Right as Christopher Reeves, but he's still very much the guy who's looking for the. He doesn't really want to fight. He always tries to find the peaceful way to resolve. You know what I'm saying? He's right. the good guy. Right. And uh, it's I think he's done an excellent job in that role. Or who uh, tried it for him anyway. Okay, let me find this email cuz we have some things to talk about. Uh <laughs> Keystroke Medium Flash Fiction Competition. <laughs> I've got an email that gives me the winners. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you guys didn't know, we did a thing here. We did. We did a thing. Tell me about it, Josh. We did a thing called the Keystroke Medium Flash Fiction Competition, which we shamelessly appropriated from Scott McGlasson and the Space Opera Writers Group, which is basically uh, a a competition wherein we ask the author to pick from a one of five reference images and then write a thousand word short story. Now, interestingly enough, I have those images ready to go to share with you all. How professional of you. <laughs> Sometimes I can click a button. Uh, so what we did was we, I found, and uh, I can't remember if anybody else suggested any of these pictures, but I, I'm just going to take sole credit for it. I found these uh, fantastic images uh, that are a mixture of Science fiction and fantasy, since that's predominantly what we like to talk about here on the show. And I thought they were pretty stunning and uh, really good uh, story fodder. 
Um, and the idea is that you would take one of these, write a, um, a short story about it, and uh, those stories would be judged by basically the same group of readers. Uh, which we call judges. And uh, those judges would rate those stories on three categories, story, character, and uh, setting? <laughs> Hold on. Let me see if I can I gotta remember what the... Uh, uh, I, think that's, I think that's right, because plot was in a thousand words. It's kind of hard uh, to... The story, yeah, story, story, character, and setting. Yeah. Uh, so we had we had four judges, uh, which for for now will remain nameless until they tell me they want to uh, reveal their names to the public for the. Um... It wasn't me. Yeah. Don't blame me. Uh, OK, so uh, the images I showed you were the five images that you could choose from. And we had uh, 19. Yes, 19 entries. And uh, those entries were read and scored individually. Those entries did not have a uh, name. I handled all the emails, which is also why we had some foul ups there at the end, as it was totally my <laughs> fault. But I'm going to blame it on the interns. Um, I I collected the emails and then stripped all the information uh, out of the. Uh, <laughs> Scott says, "Don't tell anyone." I was uh, yes. Scott was not one of the judges. He and, was not. Uh, did not read any of the stories. Uh, so. Okay, so what we did to, to keep it fair is I handled all the emails. Uh, I dropped all of the stories into a shared folder uh, with their title only, and then the judges read those stories not knowing who wrote them. And then they rated them on a one-to-five scale uh, for uh, story, character, and setting. So there's a, 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 a total, and on this competition, there was a... a, a uh, Max score of 60 per story because we had full four uh, judges. Uh, and so the the way the rules is, is the the top three uh, scored stories would go to Tony Weiskopf, the editor and publisher of Bane Books. We've had her on the show before. She's a fantastic person. Uh, yes, Leo, we can see you. Hello. Hello. Hello, Leo. Uh, and... Uh, so we sent the finalists to Tony, and Tony um, scored them first, second, and third. And so what I'm going to do is uh, announce the winner. The The first runner-up, which is fourth place. Uh, first of all, let me just say that there is, from, from 12th to second place, there is a difference of nine points. So a lot of these stories are super duper duper close. Uh, and matter of fact, first and second tied. Um, so, okay, so we'll go for fourth place. Fourth place was Torch the Sky. Uh, and let me get the, let me pull up the, the names here so I can tell you who the authors were because I've got a master list. <laughs> Uh, Towards the Sky by uh, Thomas Hottle, T.S. Hottle, who's uh, in the chat right now. That was number four as the first runner-up. Uh, third place is Rescue by Patricia Gillum, uh, a very own. Uh, it was the second. There was two uh, rescue stories in here, um, but the the one by Patricia Gillum got uh, third place, and then. First place. Well, second place. Well, yes, but if I tell you who second place is, you'll know who the first place is by default. Because I've already I already presented the list. Uh, but the author is not aware. Uh okay, so first place. Drum roll, please. Let me just say to Josh that EXE. The the so <laughs> the first second and third place tied with 49 points i said there was a total of 60 points so second and third tied at 49 points 
Fourth was 47 points. Like I said, there was not a very big difference from 12th place to second place. First, 59 points first place scored in this deal. Uh, and so on the the judges heard by Leo Vaccaro won first place and also won first place from Tony. Tony actually nice. Tony's rankings matched our judges ratings down the line. So uh, first place, Leo Vaccaro with herd second place is uh sir barris and i think that was uh Cerberus. no sir barris sir barris oh, okay. uh keith taylor is second place and then third place is patricia gillum with rescue uh so i want to give a big round of applause to all the contestants for no tony liked you a lot leo apparently yes she did not she did not think it sucked leo vaccaro won first place uh, which also means he wins nothing, just a golf, golf clap, clap of appreciation, appreciation. from everyone. Uh, and I will post the uh, the list of the uh, the stories. Um, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to post with the scores. I don't want any anybody to have any hurt feelings or anything. Uh, I'm, can we I'm put them on the KSM website? Yeah, no, uh, we can. Uh, I just I don't know if I'm going to post them with the scores or just where oh. they ranked. Mm. Um, and then maybe I'll have, if you would like to know where your story ended up and how it ranked, uh, maybe you could just reach out on a, on a private message or something on Facebook. Um, but, uh, again, I, I would like to really thank everyone that submitted a story. Uh, they were really fun, uh, to read through and man, it is super hard to complete in a, a full like connect like a complete short story in a thousand words that's flash fiction man that is it's tough I, that is super hard to write for me anyway i don't it just i need i need room to play <laughs> you know i don't you gotta be you gotta have your stuff tight for for that kind of thing yeah uh yeah so uh i want to thank tony again for taking the time to read the finalists we're gonna do this again uh we're gonna do it again uh for the well, I think we're going into the third quarter now, but but we are going to do a nether competition. Um, we may or may not see if we can finagle a, like a physical, like a, a plaque or something. I don't know. It depends on how many people actually like uh, uh, the competition. Um, maybe we can take like a little donation or see if we can make a plaque or something. Um, we are going to do it again. Uh, Scott McGlasson is talking about doing some kind of combined competition with space opera writers. I don't know if that's going to work, um, but uh, it was it was a huge amount of fun, and I'm really excited to see that so many people wanted to participate and want to continue to participate in it. So, um, good times. That is it for the flash fiction competition of Doom. So. so <laughs> So the next one, what we need to do is um, all the hosts write the stories and we let the audience. <laughs> oh, that could get dirty. <laughs> that, could. that could get dirty real quick. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again. Keep your, keep your thought uh, caps on for short fiction um, here, probably in the next two weeks or so um, we'll do it again. I want to see if I can get um, a couple of different judges. I've got, I had four this time. I want to see if I can get a couple of other judges, maybe, uh, maybe a couple of more just to see if we can get uh, some, some more reading. Uh, I don't know. What do you call it? Uh, so if you're interested in being a judge for the next competition, send me a, um, a note on Facebook, send me a message. And uh, we can probably work that out because it doesn't take me anything. It doesn't matter how many judges we have. Um, it's probably, <laughs> probably. Listen, Leo. I'm sorry. Leo. Somebody asked if they knew about your romance novels. And <laughs> Leo said the first one is Lust of Valor. Lust of Valor. <laughs> Lust of Valor. I like that. 
Oh my gosh. I do not I'm hate write that. that under your name just for the hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Lust of valor. <laughs> just to screw up your all soap <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can uh, uh. Oh, that's funny. There we go. There you go. <laughs> uh yeah. Uh Rick said he'd be a judge. All right, we'll get you on the list, Rick. Uh, let's talk about subverting expectations. Uh, I, it, the reason I thought about this is, um, are the stories good? Yes. So, uh, actually, uh, Tom reached out to me before. We, okay. Back up. I'm still in the flash fiction. What is this? Ma uh -huh. yes. <laughs> anyway, so we're talking about the flash fiction stuff. Uh, yes. Um, I would like to post the stories. What I'll what I'm going to do is send out an email to all of the authors and see if they care or don't care or whatever. And then maybe we can put together like a just maybe like a word document with all the stories. Probably I don't know that we're gonna publish it per se, like on Amazon or anything, but we may put it together and make it available for the community. Um I don't know. There's there's a lot of uh because we can't publish it and publish the pictures, right? Because then we're making money off the pictures. We're copyright violations. There's a whole bunch of things that go on with that. Um, uh, so we'll just have to figure out the best way to go about it. I would like to publish the stories and have uh, other people read them. Uh, so probably today or tomorrow, I'll send out an email. I'll get the basically the OKs from people who don't mind other people reading their stories. Uh, and then I'll, I'll see about putting it together and, and either putting it in the Facebook group or sending it out or something like that we'll, we'll get it taken care of uh okay subverting expectations i thought about this uh topic because of outer range it's a new uh tv show on amazon starring josh brolin and it's uh the last five minutes i posted on about facebook when i watched it last week the, the last five minutes of that show like blew me away and uh You're like we talked like the premiere episode right yes yes uh because uh, you know you watch the commercials and you're like okay this is something different all right i'm i'm down with that and then when you get into the show you're like okay it is it's super different and then you get to the end of the show and you're like wow and and talk about a masterpiece of storytelling and i don't it's really hard to talk about because i i really don't want to spoil it um uh, maybe in in a, in a couple of weeks after it's been out for a while, we'll talk about that. But the way that you know how some shows set up certain events and then intercut two different things happening at the same time, and then even on the episode, you have obviously multiple plot threads happening in the episode. Uh, but you're following this chain of events that's happening, and in my mind, you're like, yeah, I know exactly how that's going to go. Like in my writer brain turns on and I'm like, I see what they're doing here. This makes sense. And then it just goes a completely other way in like the last 30 seconds. And we talked about like the difference between a twist and subverting expectations. Right. That was going to be my first question. I mean, how do you tell the difference? It's real. Like, like it's tough because I think subverting you subvert expectations with twists um and so i think they can almost go hand in hand um now it's kind of like the the f the first season of the first book of game of thrones we talked about this before the show um uh, with eddard stark and uh him dying right so that is a twist yes because you didn't see that coming but it also subverts the expectations of the readers and the watchers thinking this dude's the hero of the show right right and and so that was, a, I think, a great example of subverting expectations. The death of Ned Stark, while it is a twist, it subverts the expectations of the people that are going into the show going, I know what this is. This is a thing. I know what it is. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> this isn't a thing. I didn't know what it is. Uh, now contrast that with the final season, and it's a, just a burning pile of poo, and they go, wow, we're subverting expectations. Well, no, you were you just horrible writers. You got lazy and had to take the easy way out. Yeah. yeah. For instance, the the um, the 
twist or subversion that Arya kills the Night King. You know, that was subverting the expectation of John having a showdown with the Night King, which was set up over seven years of Game of Thrones TV. And then they subverted expectations by having Ari Arya kill the Night King. And that that was I mean that's that's that was horrible writing. Like if, if I think I think that the subverting expectations a, a plot twist, a twist, I think is more kind of a sudden thing. You know, yeah. it's it's not you don't spend a lot of time setting up a twist because you want it to be a, a nut punch out of nowhere. Right. Because that's how because you want it. To, you want to make them feel twisted. Right. Whereas subverting an expectation, you have to spend some time building up that expectation. Yeah. And then, yes, there's a twist at the end of that 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 subverts the expectation. But because you spent time trying to get them to expect something. I think that's the big difference. It's like that that twist is like the the dot on the exclamation point. You know, it's just yeah. you build up to it and then boom, and it, it's not what they expected to see. I think that's the biggest difference between a plot twist and a subversion. Well, exactly. And and uh, uh, I think that goes, goes to the point about uh, bad examples of subverting expectations, but also bad twists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like we've we've talked about Star Wars for a really, really long time, and the last uh, couple of movies that have come out that are uh, the Last Jedi and the Rise of Skywalker. And the Last Jedi was just a uh, <clears throat> the, the the most uh, egregious example of horrible, horrible, horrible writing, uh, and under the guise of subverting expectations. Um, right. Well, that can be used as an excuse for. Lazy it, it's very true um but anyway so the good examples of subverting expectations i i really wanted to talk about because um it i think we kind of uh, like we've already kind of done here kind of focused on the uh, everybody focuses on the bad and then even they lay just lay bad writing at that like you're saying outer range was great i thought the 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 yeah i'm about to watch that one the 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 twist but the subversion at the end of the first episode is really good and then it it carries through and that's the thing it's it's a twist but it also carries through to the subsequent episodes and so you're thinking that it's something and it it is not that thing and it becomes something else and that is really cool the way that they set that up and the way yeah. that they're building that story I uh, when when you when you talk when you mentioned the topic, the first thing that popped there were two things, and the first one that popped into my mind was the Scorsese film Shutter Island, yeah, uh, with DiCaprio and uh, Hulk, whatever. Mark it is, Mark Ruffalo, Mark Ruffalo, yeah, great movie, um, great movie, and they do they do the the brilliance in in that that whole subverting the expectations thing, and it, spoilers ahead for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, is they spend the movie kind of, you almost suspect that DiCaprio's like an actual patient through the whole thing. Yeah. You know, so you kind of see that coming, but where they subvert the expectations is in the last five or 10 minutes when he pretends to lose his mind again. So they'll kill him. Yeah. Or not, or, you know, lobotomize him or whatever. Right. Because right. he feels like he deserves it. And you, and they, the whole story is you, is is set up for that moment so you go wow i get why he would want somebody to to scramble his brains yeah you know and that because you had i had that expectation all the way of like okay they're gonna find out he's the patient da 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 and it you know and that's the story and and they did a great job of kind of halfway making me wonder too but that last five or ten minutes that was where the subversion occurred and that was brilliant it was absolutely brilliant that was, I, that was the first one that popped into my head. And I think that that, that story, that movie uh, went into it purposefully and you could tell they went into it purposely and it just didn't get to the end and go, we don't really know how to do this. We don't know how to end this really well. So we're just going to make this twist. and It'll be fine. But no, even, it was all built it around was, that. It was right. And like even the first five minutes of the movie, when Ruffalo is trying to take his gun out 
and it catches on his thing and the he's trying to get the holster off his pants and all the guards are looking at him like he's stupid and he's like oh, i'm trying to get it out and then that i and i no, didn't know anything about the movie when i first watched it and i as soon as that happened i'm like something's up here they, they're not yeah. feds yeah this guy's not or he is the greenest guy in the world yeah <laughs> Yeah, the exactly. other one, the other one, and I don't uh, that that popped into my head, and I cannot remember the name of it. It's a Dean Koontz story, and it's about a guy who's trying to keep a cult from killing this little kid and his mom, and the cult believes that the little kid is uh, the Antichrist, and he's going to destroy the world. So they go on like this road trip with this cult chasing him, trying to kill the kid, and. You know, and the whole time, I can't remember if I read it or saw it or what. It was a long time ago. But the whole time, the kid is nothing but a kid. Servants of Twilight, I think, is the movie. Is that what it was? Is the book. Um, But it's like, there's, I never, I don't remember ever seeing any kind of indication that he was anything other than just a little kid. Mm -hmm. But then in like the last few minutes of the, of the book, after the, after the uh, the cultists have been dealt with and stuff, you find out the kid actually is the Antichrist, and he comes in and he kills the guy that's been protecting him this whole time with some you know magic wave of his hands or whatever. So um, you know, I thought that, I, but that also, I think that one kind of falls on the gray line between a plot or a subversion and a plot twist, simply because he didn't do anything to specifically lead you in a certain direction belief about this kid, Hmm. but he didn't, but it's almost like it's what he didn't say. You know what I mean? Right. You know, it's like he, he just, he just kind of left it alone and then it just came out of nowhere. And that, you know, that kind of falls under twist, but it it was, I just, that was, that story has always stuck out in my head for that reason. Cause it, it fooled me. And, most writers, we have a tendency to be able to figure out stories when we're watching TV or whatever. Right. Uh, one of the examples that I thought of, I, I was having a, I had a phone call with Steve earlier today, Steve Bullier, and we were talking about this. And yeah, I thought he was um, going to show up today. Yeah, he had some stuff come up; he couldn't make it. So, uh, but we were talking about Ozark uh, on Netflix. And, yeah, I still need uh, to watch that. Fantastic show, uh, great, great story. Um, it reminds me of. Um, uh, it reminds me of Justified. Um, if there wasn't like a marshal, like if there wasn't a law marshal in it, it like you talk. What I mean by the uh, the criminals, like the the whole back the criminal rest. side of the yes. con- the country mafia kind of right, thing. right. That's that's the kind of flavor that I kind of uh, uh, label this as, and it, but it's really good. I mean, Justified was good too. Um, but how this, I think, how this plays into subverting expectations is um, the the main character is not a criminal, like starting out, and he kind of gets pulled into this world, Dixie Mafia. There you go. Yeah, Thanks, there you man. go. Um he kind of gets pulled into this whole thing uh, against his will. And um, a lot of the things that happen um, happen uh, as he's getting pulled into more and more things against his will. And he can't, there's nothing he can do to get out of it seemingly. And there's um, the way, the ways that he gets out of these situations or succeeds where other people might fail are, not the typical ways that you would think he would get out of it. And it's, it's almost like the whole series is based on subverting the expectation of the viewer, because we've all seen these kind of movies or the shows and movies. And we're like, okay, we know how he's going to get out of it. And he doesn't, he doesn't do what we think he's going to do. He does, does something else. And we're like, how the, how's that going to work? And then it, And then the result happens and you're like, holy shit. And it's not even, it's not even really a twist, right? Like it's just the way that he approached. Just the way he thought through. See, and that to me, that's one of the great things about taking a, well, like in the case you're describing, I haven't seen the show, but I've heard a little bit about it. He's like this regular dude, need money, gets involved with the criminals, but he's not a criminal himself. So he doesn't think like one. So you're watching this. And whoever's writing it has to solve the problems he runs into 
from somebody who's not a criminal, which is going to change because because people come in expecting it to be, oh, criminal solves criminal problem. Yeah. But it's regular Joe solves criminal problem. And that's right. where you get that. That's where you get that subversion. I love stories like have you ever written anything like that? Have you ever tried to subvert expectations in your in your own the, books? The only um, the only story that I can think of um where it, like you're saying it kind of draws the line between plot twist and expectations is i wrote a short story once for a superhero anthology that steve bowyer put on and uh, the fireman one yeah yes yes i think that's what it was fireman um well yes yeah, well he was a there was fireman yes yeah uh, i remember i read it i know what you're talking about yeah so in that instance i told the story from two different perspectives and two different timelines and right. the the main character hated superheroes and there was a reason he hated superheroes um and then it like you see why that hatred kind of evolved over the course of the story um but then at the end uh it gets turned on its face where um uh, he's helped by someone who that superhero helped and it, it, it like closes the loop. Like, and it, uh, yeah. That's, that's what I liked about it. Cause I thought that's a kind of a cyclical story. Cause it, yeah. kind of just, it came back to, Oh, okay. Well, maybe I was wrong about that. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, and so like, I wrote that not to subvert like hero expectations, but that it's basically, I like to write a lot of stories where the, um, I mean, I'm going to say this is like a broad spectrum of of a, a, a description of humanity, but people are dumb. Yeah. Right. And they base we base a lot of our understanding and perceptions on things that might not be true. Absolutely. Uh, and that's not a statement of like what's going on in the in the current like political geopolitical spectrum in the world. It's just like the truth. No, people. Just, that's a statement on history. Yeah. People make assumptions on things that they believe based on things that may or may not be true or in uh, based on the way that they interpret them, which is also shaded by their experience and their stuff. So I like to write stories that like really kind of delve into that. Um, and so that was my interpretation of someone, someone who his experience was framed by a personal experience, but he was looking at it through a very tunnel eyed vision of that event not the whole event as a whole um but but as far as writing uh writing a a a whole story subverting expectations no i have not the, the fantasy story that i'm working on kind of does um because i uh like for instance in this story trolls are in this story but trolls are not like mindless killing machine antagonists they're yeah. they're actually a, a, a functional part of society same yeah. thing with same thing with goblins even though my goblins are are tricksters and they 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 um uh, are wanting to uh they always try to get the upper hand in any situation that they're dealing they're the with Ferengi of your setting yeah exactly <laughs> um uh yeah so i like you said, it's it's hard to kind of make that draw that distinction between subversion and twists. But I think as a twist, like it happens and it's like, ah, but subversion is something early and yeah. that you can, What's you that can thing? carry well, through yeah. the story. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like seven, seven, ha the ending of seven is kind of a twist, but the yeah, whole I would call that a twist. But the whole thing is kind of like a subversion on the genre, right? Because I'll give you that. Uh, like, if you're talking about just the whole crime, like the, genre the story, a whole, right? Yeah. The story as a whole is kind of a subversion yeah. of of that. Uh, but the the twist at the end, well, there was a. It's like a double twist, right? Because you have the yeah, that the, was a that uh, was brilliant, dude. Just the ending of done. that movie, like just. You could just say what's in the box, and anybody will like what's in the fucking box. Yeah, yeah. Everybody picks it up, yeah. and I I don't know. Like Seven is probably one of my top five movies of all time. Yeah, uh, agreed, agreed. And uh, and it, but especially not just, for that genre. 
Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. yeah not just for the ending, yeah. for the whole the way they presented the whole thing. The whole mystery. I mean, it was just just so well done. Uh, that's actually a really uh kit just said subversion is against tropes, twist is against plot. I like that. That I, like I would that. I would accept that, but I still think that that the subversion thing, there's kind of a setup for it. It's like you se- it's like you're setting it up, setting up reader viewer expectations with the intention of the plot and making them go, what? Cause like if they're expecting the twist mm. to go a certain way, yeah. but you twist the other way, right? you're subverting those expectations. Yeah. Know? And so, yeah. And so in very much that's accurate, it would go against tropes because that's kind of what you're basing your expectations on, depending on what genre you're, you're reading slash viewing. And that actually touches right into Rick's comment about not liking seven because the bad guy was a nobody like that expectation of the bad guy in that movie. Like, like there was so much that guy did that was just crazy. That just is over the top. And, and they made this point to, you know, he's independently wealthy and there's no way that anybody that's a nobody could have pulled all this off. And so they're building it up to be somebody uh, and then it was nobody. So that that was actually a subversion on. I the- got, see. I actually like that part. Oh, of me it. too. Me too. I, I love. I love. I love when they 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 point out that yes, there are real monsters in the world, and they look just like you and me. You know, there was a yeah. movie, uh, a Nicolas Cage movie called Eight Millimeter, where he oh, plays a dude, brutal he plays, movie. Yes, and he plays the private detective trying to solve who got killed in the snuff film. Yeah. When he faces off with the guy that did the killing in the film and he gets the better of him. And I actually, I think that was uh, the guy that played Tony Soprano actually played the, the guy. Um, he takes off the leather gimp mask yeah, and he's like, my name's Larry. I work in a garage. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that moment. Cause you're, cause they spent the whole thing building up. He's this big beefy guy and you're expecting, you know, just, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he's just a dude in a stupid mask. I mean, you know, with a big knife. That's it's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's, it, you just don't know. You know, it just points out that you just don't know what's what's behind somebody's eyes. Yeah, true. Uh, he said, it felt like taking away from the buildup instead of subverting it. I felt like I felt like it took away from the buildup instead of subverting it. I, I think that was kind of the point, was that the... the 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 buildup was an ultimate like an it, it, like the buildup was actually like an ant anticlimactic buildup to who actually the criminal was because yeah. it really it really didn't matter who the criminal was the yeah because you're kind of expecting a super villain you yeah know, the the, right. the super rich anti Batman type who just kills because he can and but it's one of those movies where it's it's a story where it's it's like it's unique in the fact that it didn't matter who John Doe was because the, the, what you remember of the movie is that seven actually was a complete thing. The crime was completed. It wasn't stopped, even though they did stop who was doing it, but he got it. He got the last His master plan was complete. Uh, and the twist at the end, uh, uh, with, brad pitt's character shooting him uh man i mean i don't know how like the the closing of the loops in that movie where that they were just Just brilliant yeah i thought it was fantastic uh (laughs) just scott says he wasn't nobody it was jackson large prostate prostate. (laughs) (laughs) and then tom said we don't talk about that (laughs) two fight club references i love it one i love it (laughs) Fight Club was that I mean that Fight Club actually subverted a lot of expectations on top of twisting like back and forth like how many twists did that show have Yeah that was that one that would be hard to call cuz yeah. I mean there was so much going on in that in that story Unbreakable was a good one I like Unbreakable the uh um the guy that didn't know he was a superhero and then turns out to be a superhero and uh I really like The reason that. he found out was because the super villain Right caused all the stuff to find him yeah Yeah, that's that's i i I could see that being a subversion i don't know that's 
That was a, a good lot movie, of. Though. I think a lot of M Night Shyamalan movies, uh, like somebody mentioned, I see dead people earlier. Um, yeah, but uh, like like uh, the Sixth Sense, like the Sixth Sense had a great twist. Uh, it's really hard to say that it. But it, it, if you go back and look, oh yeah, it was it was very it's kind obvious. obvious. It was yeah. obvious. Um, but a lot of his movies do have really good twists that kind of subvert what he was trying to do with the genre of film, yeah. right? Like, so like the village, the, that's was, the one I was thinking about the village. was, it was set up to be like this horror movie that everybody was going like, Oh, these, these alien creatures are chasing them and going to an M night Shyamalan movie. You're like, Oh yeah, I get that. Like there's alien creatures in it. And then it turns out that's not a thing. Uh, and it was something completely different. I thought yeah. that was a, a really good. Uh, yeah, that actually, I mean, it was a twist, right? But it was yeah. it was a subversion of what you're expecting. I thought that I, I I actually enjoyed that one. I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, Scott says, "Serious question, Casp. What's the difference between deconstruction and expectation subversion? Deconstruction and expectation subversion. I um, I don't I don't know. Um." Deconstruction I, I, in a story. I mean that. I, I honestly don't know that I've ever heard that particular uh, term. I, I mean, you can deconstruct unless, unless you're talking about mechanically breaking down a story into right. this element, that element, that element. Now, if you're talking about it within the framework of a of of a piece of fiction, I mean, I guess you know if you're in some literature type stuff, I know will like talk about deconstructing a character's psyche or right. something. And, you know, that's, that's about the only thing I know of that I can think of there. I mean, from a writer's standpoint, you can deconstruct how they subverted those expectations and then talk. Yeah. About but then that, that's elements. more, that's more of a mechanical under the hood right. kind of deconstruction. Um, no, like the deconstruction of a superhero story. I don't know, man. Uh, yeah. That to me, that sounds like a, like you're looking at it, not from within the story, but from outside the story and breaking down this, these are the parts of a superhero story or whatever. So I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, one of these days we'll have to get Scott on like the actual show so he can use his big words like live, like in, he, he can he use big words. Like, uh, like Rick says, for example, Watchmen was a deconstruction of the superhero genre. I, you know, I don't, I don't see it that way. Uh, I, it was definitely a different take on the superhero genre, unless they're using deconstruction in the sense of taking it from some kind of elevated, non-realistic moral expectation, you know, like classic superheroes are. Yeah. And then Watchmen was one of the first thing that kind of brought it down to real world. This is what it would really be like. Mm. And they would actually just be horrible, horrible people. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, let's face it. That's the truth. Um, now, in that sense, I could see deconstructing being something like if you took. I didn't really like, like, if, you, the like if you write a I Sherlock couldn't... Holmes book and you don't focus on Sherlock Holmes, the detective, but you focus on Sherlock Holmes, the drug addict. Right. You know, I think that would be a deconstruction of Holmes in literature. Yeah. Bart saying. Uh... Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying, Rick. Yeah. yeah. The previous to say anyway yeah tears the basics of the genre and look at it in the light of day yes um i think that would be a, a whole different show to talk about how you would do that on a variety of topics and genres because yeah. i think you could do that with every genre um but i don't necessarily know that that taking apart one of those genres is subverting it it's just changing it because if you go yeah. into you go into something like a a Watchmen movie. Uh, I did not have any expectations going into the Watchmen movie because I didn't know anything about Watchmen. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, we'll have to get Scott on here. Maybe Scott can come on and talk about deconstructing some. Uh, or we could have Scott and Rick have a like a a face off, a deconstruction face off about uh, whatever. <laughs> Bard, I actually kind of like Bard's description. Deconstruction seeks to destroy previous tropes and genres with no positive result. <laughs> I like that actually. 
This guy's I'm, no. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of deconstructions. I'm really not. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that there, I, the more I, I watch shows and read books as a writer, um, the, the more that I'm looking for how they're setting up the twists. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and when I get something that I'm like, oh, okay, I can see how this twist is going. And then that doesn't happen. That's when I get excited about a book. Um, so Nick Fate, yeah, I want to take his face. Oh, what a great, what a great movie Face Off was. That really was. It really was. I think Face Off was probably one of those fun movies that really didn't have any twists. It was just like no, the, it was just cool. back and forth. Like, <laughs> yeah, let's John Travolta overact and Nick Cage go crazy like he's a drug addict fiend like scraping his face on shit like ah! yeah yeah that was that was one of their but be- one of both of those actors one of their best i think uh anyone thank who you, has Le- a uh, big you, trouble in little that. china poster is super cool epic blame levels. that movie for my love of urban fantasy <laughs> <laughs> and doves yes that's true and doves. <laughs> uh listen it, uh, i don't know i know we had um uh jeffrey haskell on the show uh last week but if you haven't picked up against all odds go and do that right now uh it's a fantastic book uh i would highly highly recommend it to anyone if you love mill sci-fi uh very 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 well done book and peter burkrot did a really good uh narration um i don't know who we're gonna have on next week i think I'm I'm almost positive there's a guest, but now I have to go back to my emails and figure out who's coming on. I I although I do uh Friday the writer's journey should be on. Or were they on this last Friday? Now I can't remember what their their this past Friday, wasn't it? Now I can't remember what their every other Friday. I don't know. I'm useless. Uh I did say that uh Jeff was on uh last coffee week. And, coffee and concepts with Walt last oh. week, and that it, that interview was really good. That was uh, a really fun time to watch that. Uh, so anyway, thanks everybody for coming and hanging out with me again. Congrats to all the winners for the flash fiction competition. I will, uh, post a, um, a list of all the stories and how they ranked. Uh, again, I'm not going to put the scores on there. So if you want the score of your story, just reach out to me on Facebook and ask, and I will surely share them. Uh, and then here in the next week or so, we should have some news on the next competition. Uh, and I'd really like everybody to submit uh, the more the merrier. It's always fun to read those different takes on stories. I think that was the funnest thing about the competition was looking at one picture and then seeing like several like wildly different takes on the same thing. That was really fun. Uh, all right. Well, we're out of here. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us. Uh, if I didn't see you in the chat, I apologize. I'm sorry. I try to get everybody in there. Uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully with Scott, and we'll talk about some reading, some writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Peace. Later, guys. <laughs>